Today we're continuing on in a sermon series called The Church Is. We're in our third week of this series, and today we're celebrating the blood of Christ together. You might be wondering, exactly how does that fit in to a definition of the church? Well, over the last uh, couple of weeks or so, we've been learning a definition of the church that I was taught when I was back in college by a wonderful, godly professor named uh, Fred Roth. And here's that definition. Let's take a look at it. We said the definition of a church is the, is the body, the church is a body of baptized believers bought by the blood and bound by the Spirit. And I've kind of been challenging you all to learn that definition with me each week. So we've been saying it together. Let's go ahead and let's do it now. Let's try it. The church is a body of baptized believers bought by the blood and bound by the Spirit. Now, you did okay there, but I'm convinced y'all can do much better. So let's hit it again. The church is a body of baptized believers bought by the blood and bound by the Spirit. And last week, we removed the words, and you guys still functioned flawlessly. Let's see if you can do so a week later. All right. The church is a body of baptized believers bought by the blood and bound by the Spirit. Okay, you all did really, really well. I want to commend you there. However, we do have a member of our congregation that is like a crazy overachiever. They just took this thing to a whole nother level. Uh, a, a parent this week sent me a picture. It's one of our homeschooling families, and their, their homeschooling student diagrammed our definition of a church. Take a look at it right here. There it is. So, yeah, for those of y'all who... Right, who just love grammar, I want you to know I would have never even attempted that. I thought that was incredible. So special thanks to our homeschooler who took the time uh, to do that work. So two weeks ago, we began our time by learning that the church is a body. And we, were just, we just took some time to, to see in the Word how uh, when we talk about the church being a body, it's a reference, if you will, to the unity of the church, right? A body, a human body, is made up of all different manner of parts, so all of us are different. We come from different ethnicities, we come from different cultures, we come from different histories, different backgrounds, but because we are all together under the headship of Jesus Christ, we are unified into a body. And so then last week, we took a look, uh, a look at the next idea there, that we are a body of baptized believers. We learned that Jesus both illustrated and commanded baptism, that he began his ministry by being baptized, and he concluded his ministry here on earth by commanding the church to go out and baptize, make disciples, and baptize people all over the world. And so when we are baptized into the body, we are both uh, following Jesus' example and we are obeying his command as we identify with him and with his church as we're immersed in baptism. And so last week, because of the topic, we thought, you know, let's put a baptistry out on the runway. It'll do two things. One, it'll get people just thinking about baptism even before they come into the building. And then second of all, we'll just put out an invitation. Hey, after hearing and thinking about what we've been talking about today, maybe you'll want to be baptized. And so we invited people to go to Fresh Start, do a Fresh Start interview. But we said, we will baptize you today if that is of your interest. And so uh, after the second service, we had uh, a few people take us up on that. Take a look. Uh, here's EJ, and he was baptized. And then here's Xavier from, Hon from Nicaragua, and Keila from Venezuela. She was baptized. And then Elizabeth was baptized, and then as was Michaela, and Michaela, her two babies were watching on as she was baptized. It was awesome. And so in addition to those baptisms that took place on Sunday, we had a number of people who either went to Fresh Start and said, man, this is a conversation I've got to have, or they've contacted the church over the course of this week and said, hey, you know what? This is something I've been thinking about all week long. I need to follow through. Uh, you know, can I still get baptized? And we were like, well, yeah, you know, of course. And so if you would like to consider and learn more about being baptized. It's not too late. Just swing by Fresh Start after the service is over today. 
and uh, you can get in on it, all right? And that brings us back to the definition, right? The church is a body of baptized believers, and then we're going to look at that next part. Today, we're going to focus in on bought by the blood. And I want you just to look at those four words for just a moment. Do you see them there? Really take them in. And if you look at them carefully, they should raise at least two questions in your mind, okay? Because as I looked at that little statement, first question that came to my mind was, well, why do I need to be bought, right? And then the second question that came to my mind was, why do I need to be bought by the blood? And so today, that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at the book of Ephesians in order to, to kind of get a handle on this. There's a couple of pieces of scripture there. We're going to be looking at a lot of different places in the Bible, but Ephesians is where we're going to begin. So open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians if you have it with you. If you have your device, go ahead and, and fire it up and find Ephesians, looking at Ephesians chapter 2 to begin. And as we look at this, we're going to, going to take, take on this first question, why was... I, why do I need to be bought? Well, what's that all about? When you think about being bought, it does sound, in our, to, to our modern ear, does it not sound a little bit objectionable? The whole idea that a person needs to be bought brings up a lot of bad imagery into our mind. We've got some history as a country, and so that kind of shades the way we think about that. So why is this a necessary and good thing? Why? Well, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in in the first verse. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. So here Paul just kind of lays out a picture of of kind of the universal part of the human condition. Notice the way he begins there. He says, as for you. And then in verse 3 he says, all of us. It's pretty obvious he's referring to every single person alive. Every single one of us. Something that we all have in common is that we are all dead in our trespasses and sin. And then he explains why this is universally true. He says, because all of us are walking, all of us are living by the standards of this world. And the standards of the world in which we live, those are not standards that are dominated by obedience to God. Would you agree? That's not the prevailing idea, the philosophy that we see at work in our world, in our country today. We do not see elders and leading statements, statesmen standing up in, in front of large groups of people saying, the most important thing that we can do is yield ourselves in obedience to the will and desire of God. That's just not what we hear in our world at all. In fact, it would be fair to say that the dominating philosophy in our world today is not one of obedience to God, but one of disobedience. And this is a big deal because God is the one who decides what is right and wrong. We decide if we're going to obey or disobey. And overall, universally, Paul says we have made the decision to disobey God. And because of that, we are under God's wrath. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment because that makes us pretty uncomfortable, doesn't it? The idea that we would be under God's wrath, we don't, we don't like that. We don't like it for a number of reasons. We don't like to think that what naturally comes to us, the kind of our default behavior, our default steps, are to do what is wrong. We don't like to think that way. We don't like to think of the reality that God is a God who practices real and true justice. We don't like to think that way. It makes us uncomfortable. We enjoy the idea that God is love, right? But the idea that God is just, that leaves us uncomfortable. We don't like the idea that God responds to evil and uh, responds to disobedience with wrath. We don't like to think about that. And we certainly don't like to think about it when it's applied to us, right? We, we like to think that, well, surely God's going to give me a pass, right? I mean, he's going to be indulgent with me. Surely I deserve an extra measure of grace because it's me after all, right? But Paul says, no, that's, that's not it. God is exacting And he is just, and everybody, everybody deserves his wrath. And the outcome 
of our participation in the evil that we see in our world today is that we are dead. Now, I want you to think about dead for a moment, okay? I think, is it fair to say that we as a culture, we as a people throughout all of human history, we're kind of obsessed with not winding up dead? It's important to us, isn't it? In fact, if you go to the hospital and you're really ill, the whole idea, the whole topic of dead is pretty much what drives that whole conversation, right? That is like job one. About five years or so ago, I had a bicycle crash, and it was a pretty good crash as crashes go, okay? I went over my handlebars downhill at about 20 miles an hour and uh, just kind of just threw myself all over the ground. And it not might knock me out, and I was out for a little while. When I come to, I'm hurting all over it, you all, okay? It was just a very thorough hurt, you know? And uh, what really bothered me, though, was my right arm, I couldn't, I couldn't move it. I was kind of doing this number. And so I assumed that I had broken, you know, a, either my collarbone or something up in here. And so I find my way home, and I go into the house. My wife is home for lunch, and I say to her, hey, uh, could you take me to the emergency room? <laughs> and she was like, what happened to you? Right? And so we go to the emergency room, and they wheel me into the emergency room, and they're very concerned because I have landed on my head, okay? And so they go into, is he going to die mode? And I kept telling them, y'all, this is not fatal, okay? I just, I can't do, you know, th this is the problem, you know? I'm not going to die. And they didn't want to hear from me at all on that. And they, they were very, you know, attend, uh, you know, very attentive and providing excellent care. But they, they weren't concerned about the arm. And I'm like, this is all I care about. Okay, and they're like, we, we've got to make sure there's not something going on because of the way that you landed. And so, and so they do a CT, they do all this kind of stuff to make sure I'm not going to die. In fact, one of them said this terrible thing. One of the nurses said, we may not be able to give you pain medication. I'm like, oh, no, you will give me my pain medication. I came here for the pain medication, that, is, that and this. Those are the reasons that I showed up, Okay. So, yes, you will. You, you must, okay? But they were concerned because, you know, so once they did the CT and did all the other work and they determined you're not going to die, which I could have told them, right? You're not going to die. Then they were kind of like, well, you may want to get that arm looked at by a doctor. I'm not making that part up. They were like, you, you know, uh, have a nice day. We have checked our boxes. You're not going to die. So have a good day and, yeah, go by the doctor. And I was like, well, thank you very much. And, and I did. I went by the doctor, and it took about three months and so to get it all kind of working again. And you all remember those days. Some of you do. And it would be like something on the screens, and I'd go, look at the screens, you know. And that went on for a good three months, right? But what were they concerned about in the emergency room? They weren't concerned about the arm. What were they concerned about? Are you going to die? That was their priority, Right? That's what they wanted to spend their time on. And so here in Ephesians 2, it says, you were dead. And dead is a big, big problem. If you're dead, there's only one thing that matters, right? Not being dead. And according to Ephesians, the scale of death that's referred to here is universal. It's huge. Everybody, every person is walking in the ways inspired by certain Satan. Every person is being driven by disobedience. And because of that, every person is dead in their sin. Ephesians 2 is saying, hey man, sin is fatal. And it's fatal 100% of the time. And again, we don't like to think of ourselves as being objects of wrath, but that's what we are, according to Ephesians 2. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were without hope in this world. And this is the reality of the human condition. The reality is we are not victims. We are perpetrators. And Ephesians 2 says that comes with a cross, a cost. It earns us the wrath of God. That is the reality of our condition. And as you look at this, you become just as focused on life and death, as the doctors were in the emergency room those years ago, right? That's the big problem. Your attention is just drawn to the sinfulness 
and to the fatality that it causes. And you just wonder, is there a solution? Is there a solution to this widespread reality of death that comes as a result of sin? And the good news is that the answer is yes, there is a solution. We need to be redeemed. We need to be purchased back from the penalty of our guilt and of our shame and from our sin. Now, what does it mean to be redeemed? What does it mean to be bought back from the reality of our debt to sin? And this is challenging for us because we don't use the words redeemed the same way that the Bible uses them. If you're old enough like I am, I remember my mother and my grandmother doing uh, green stamps. Y'all remember? Anybody old enough besides me to remember green stamps? Okay. Green stamps were this thing. You would go to the grocery store, you'd buy your groceries. And then in addition to giving you a receipt, they would print out or just hand you rather all these stickers. Okay, there were stamps, they were green in color, hence the name green stamps. And you had a little green stamp book, and you would fill that book up. And when you got enough green stamp book you know, put together, you could go and buy stuff. And you all, it was crazy what you could buy with green stamps, okay? I'm convinced if you had enough green stamps, you could go like and buy a house. I mean, it was crazy, the stuff that you could buy with green stamps. And so for me growing up, the word that I always heard used around green stamps when it was time to go and turn your books in and get stuff was, it's time to redeem the green stamps. Anybody remember that? Okay. So our idea of what it means to be redeemed it does not line up with what the Bible has in mind when it says we need to be redeemed. Okay. In order to get that, let's go back to the Old Testament because the idea of redemption is a deeply biblical idea. Let's look at it in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 47. It says, suppose a foreigner or a temporary resident becomes rich while living among you. If any of your fellow Israelites fall into poverty and are forced to sell themselves to such a foreigner or to a member of his family, they still retain the right to be bought back, even after they have been purchased. They may be bought back by a brother, an uncle, or a cousin. In fact, anyone from the extended family may buy them back. Now, what in the world is going on here? What, is, what, is, what are we talking about? Okay. Here's the deal. In the Old Testament, in the days of the Old Testament, if somebody fell into debt, if they fell into poverty, maybe they uh, had uh, some just real misfortune economically, maybe they made some really bad decisions economically, didn't really matter the reason. Uh, If they fell deeply into debt and there was really no other way out, they could sell themselves into servitude, okay? Now think about that for a moment. Imagine being so desperate financially that your best bet was to sell yourselves into servitude just to pay the debt, okay? Now, they could sell themselves into servitude to another fellow Israelite, right, to another citizen of the same country, but they could also sell themselves into servitude to a foreigner who happened to be living among them. But regardless of who became their owner, regardless of who became their owner, there were rules that had to be followed, the, the poor person who had sold themselves, still it was required that they be treated with respect, that they be treated with dignity. They were to be treated like a hired worker or laborer. This was a financial relationship, okay? And it was, it was a financial repl- uh, relationship that was put into place as a matter of last resort. This was a way that you could, with dignity, get out of a debt that you would otherwise never be able to to get out of. And so because of that, anybody who bought another person, right, and and brought them in in this way, owed it to them to treat them graciously and to see this as this is a way that I'm helping this person to get back on their feet. Now, as we just read, there's another piece to this thing. If there was a reversal of fortunes, right, if maybe a relative of yours came along to, if you will, bail you out of that to buy you out of that, or any other means. If there was a way that you could be leveraged back out of servitude, that was completely possible, okay? They could go in, they could pay the required price, they could pay off the debt, and you would be released. You would be set free again. You would be redeemed. Do you get it? Okay? So to redeem somebody from slavery involved paying a price, And that price was sometimes called a ransom. But either way, 
to be redeemed meant that someone came in, they paid your debt, and they bought back your freedom. So you went from servitude to liberty, right? You went from having no options to having every option. It was a huge deal, and that freedom was available to you because someone stepped in on your behalf, and they paid your debt for you, all right? You with me? Now, let's put that together and look here again at Ephesians 2. All people, you, me, everybody you know, all of us are enslaved to sin. They're all locked away because of their own decisions and their own evil, their own wickedness. And their only hope, their only shot at freedom is to be redeemed, to be purchased from their slavery and sin. And that purchase price, right, that that purchase price must be paid by somebody who cares enough about them to find a way to pay the cost, okay? And remember, the greater the debt, the greater the price of redemption. You got it? So that's the first question. Why do I need to be bought? Well, I need to be redeemed, right? Right? And remember, the greater the debt, the greater the price of redemption, which brings us to the the second question. Why do I need to be bought by the blood? Why did our redemption and our forgiveness have to come through Jesus' death? So let's jump from Ephesians 2 back to Ephesians 1 for a moment to kind of get that idea. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now look there at verse 7. We have redemption through what? His blood, right? We have redemption through his blood. What's that about? How does blood make for redemption? Well, if you look back at the Old Testament, you know that that in the Old Testament, there was a sacrificial system in which people brought animals and they took them to the temple or to the tabernacle, depending on when it was in the Old Testament. But they would bring an animal and they would put him on the altar and they would offer that animal as a sacrifice. But that blood that was offered of that animal, it it would never truly cleanse all of the offender's sin. It wouldn't do it. it. It was really a symbol Hebrews says this about it in Hebrews 10.4. It says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But the blood of Jesus is different. It's it's far more than a symbol. The the blood of Jesus is effective. Look at what it says in Hebrews 9, verse 12. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he, this is Jesus, entered the most holy place once more. For all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Okay? And here's the idea. God God didn't just ignore the destructive power of sin on our relationship with him, okay? He, He doesn't just forgive. He goes far beyond that. He forgives and he redeems us. He buys us back from the bondage that our sin has created. And the cost of that redemption is the cross, the the blood of Jesus Christ. So on the cross, Jesus willingly shed his blood and he pays the price to redeem you and to redeem me. Our sins and trespasses are forgiven so that you and I can be set free from our slavery to sin, free to walk in a whole new life in Jesus Christ. And think about this. This is a whole new opportunity, just as it would be for someone who found themselves sold into slavery because of their unsurmountable debt. And now they have been bought right? They've been bought back. They've been given freedom. It is a whole new start. And that's what happens when we receive the saving work of Jesus Christ. We get a whole new start. And we believe, the Bible teaches, that there's no other means by which our sins can be forgiven and by which we can be redeemed and by which we can have a whole new start in the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been bought. We've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. 
Look at Romans 3.23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sin. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. Think about that. The price for our redemption was one that God was willing to pay. A couple of weeks ago, we, we saw it just a moment ago. We saw the video about it. A couple of weeks ago, we had our car show. And a lot of you all were awesome. It worked so hard. It was, in fact, it was just a week ago. It wasn't two weeks ago. And so many of you all volunteered. You worked so hard to make it happen. So I'm at the car show. And uh, there's all these amazing vehicles there. And, and, you know, I admire two things about those ridiculously gorgeous cars that have been restored. Some of these from the, the 40s and 50s and so. I see those cars, and one, I'm amazed by how much work it took to restore that car, okay? The second thing I must admit I am blown away by is how much money it would have taken to restore that car, okay? So I'm walking around the car show, and there's a car sitting there, and it really hasn't had a lot of restoration to it, okay? And so I'm standing there, and another guy is there, and he says, you know, I really like that car. And like a lot of, of gentlemen who are not young, they, he looked at this, and he was like, I remember that car from when I was a kid. Right? I remember thinking that was like the coolest car I've ever seen. And the price on the car in its kind of unrestored state was about $5,000. He said, you know, I'm thinking about buying that car. And I could hear his wife now going, no. But anyway, I said, I'm thinking about buying that car. And then he said, but I'm not sure if I'm ready to put the money that it would take into it to make it what it needs to be. I'm just not sure it's worth it. What was he doing? He was counting the cost, wasn't he? And that's a wise thing to do. But here's the beautiful thing. Christ looks at you and me, and he sees us in the state of disrepair that we are in. And he also sees the full potential of what we could be if we were set free from the bondage of sin. So he made the investment. He paid the price. He gave his life and he shed his own blood. And he redeemed us. He bought us back at a great price so that he could bring us back to God. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we are brought together in this body, right? And we are unified under the head of the church, Jesus Christ. Because every single one of us, if you're a part of the church, you've been bought, you've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And he saw you in your slavery to sin. And he saw you in your wickedness and in your evil. And he said, I'm willing to pay the price so that they might move from slavery to freedom. You get it? The church is a body of baptized believers. And we were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. So here's what this means for us. It means that when you're looking yourself in the mirror after having fallen short yet again. Have you ever had that moment? You've fallen short yet again. And you look yourself in the mirror and you're just like, I can't believe I did it. And when you feel like you can't live with yourself because of what you've done, your message to yourself at that moment is to go, wait a minute. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. My story doesn't end right here in front of this mirror. And when someone reminds you of the mistakes and failures from your past, and they want to hold it against you, right? They want to hold that up so that you and perhaps other people see it. It would be appropriate if you looked at them and you said, excuse me, all of that is true, but I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. It'd be appropriate to say that. 
And when a brother or sister in Christ that you know feels down because of just the reality of their history, because of where they've been, because of what they've done, it would be appropriate for you to look at them and say, you know what, true statement, you were in slavery. That's who you were. But you've been redeemed. You've been declared worthy Jesus has seen you in your bondage, and he has chosen to shed his blood for you. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are free in Jesus Christ. It's a totally different thing. You see, that's the glorious message of the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you meet Jesus and you confess your sin and you ask him to redeem you, you are born again. You are born from above. You are remade. You were a sinner, and you were a child of wrath. And you may still stumble, you know, but your days of slavery, they're over. They're gone. You're not who you were. You're a whole new creation. You've joined the saints. You are reborn. You have a whole new life in front of you because you've been purchased and set free. And the beautiful thing is, you all, none of the past was just swept under the rug. God didn't just pretend that you weren't really guilty. God dealt with it. He solved the problem. He paid the price. And he redeemed you, right? And he knows about everything. He knows all your whole story. He knows how you betrayed somebody. He knows about the lie. He knows about the night of shame. He knows about every single bit of it. He knows all of it. And having seen every last bit of it, fully aware of who you are, he said, you're worth the price of being redeemed and being made new by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you're free. You're free to renew your mind You're free to follow after the things of God in a way you never had before. You have a fresh start, just like someone who was bought from slavery and brought into freedom. Your whole world is brand new. You do not have to be who you were. That's what it means to be bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the prayer becomes, God, I want to see the results, right? I want to see the results, of having been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ everywhere in my life. I want to see it in my marriage. I want to see it in my relationship with my kids. I want to see it in my relationship with my boss. I want to be able to look everywhere and see the power of the blood of Jesus Christ because I am free, and I'm free because of the blood of Jesus. So that's the invitation. Today's the day for you to say, Jesus, thank you for seeing me in my sin and for paying the penalty of my sin, and for shedding your blood to redeem me. Let's pray together right now. Father, I thank you so much for the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that given our history, given who we are and were, that you would see us in our sin and make the decision that we were worthy of the blood of Jesus. And so, God, we say thank you. And there are people in this room today, Father, who are still very much living under full bondage of their sin. They are still carrying the weight, the baggage of it all. And so, Lord, we just come before you today, and we ask that today would be the day that anyone here in that condition would determine, I am not leaving here the same way that I came in. I'm going to leave here enjoying the freedom of having been redeemed. So, Father, just make that so today. Grant them the courage to take those steps today. We love you, Father. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ, by whose blood we have been redeemed. It's in his name we pray. Amen.